Okay, from this year, 2016, we've been looking at this topic of what it means to be in Christ or in Adam. We are either in Christ or we are in Adam. And we've been looking at different messages of how to live out our life from that place of being in Christ. Now, the conversation that Jesus had with his disciples in John chapter 14 was just before uh, Jesus demonstrated the greatest act of love when he stood in the place as son of God representing sinners that whoever receives him and believes in him will receive forgiveness of sin. And he also demonstrated our acceptance before God so that we can live in harmony and in relationship with God. But if we can devote our time this week, four chapters in the Bible, John chapter 14 to 17, read it every day, try and get a hold of that, you will understand what our Christian life is all about. Four chapters, John 14 to John 17. Meditate on it and ask God for revelation. So this morning we're going to look at uh, verses from John chapter 14, and we'll pick a few verses from 15 and 16. So I'm looking at uh, the Amplified Version, uh, so you can follow on the slides. The text of my message this morning is Christ indwelling presence in us. In John chapter 14, verse 8, Philip said to Jesus, Show us the Father. Cause us to see the Father that is all we ask, and then we shall be satisfied. Jesus replied, Have I been with you all for so long a time, and you do not recognize and know me yet, Philip? So, uh, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say then, show us the Father? Now, many of us are like Philip. We've been Christians for many years. We have uh, done our daily devotions uh, in, a, in a routine, but really not understood who Jesus is. And that was the case with Philip. Hung around with Jesus, been around with Jesus, and asked Jesus, show, him, show me the Father. Look at Jesus' response to Philip. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? What I am telling you, I do not say on my own authority and of my own accord, but the Father who lives continually in me does his works and his own miracles and deeds of power. So Jesus is defining his relationship with God. He's defining for us who he, who he is. He is in the Father, and the Father is in him. He goes on to say in verse 11, Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Or else believe me for the sake of my very works themselves. If you cannot trust me, at least the, let these works that I do in my Father's name convince you. So what we are talking about, Almighty God embodied in Jesus. Everything we see about Jesus describes for us who the Father is. And everything the Father God is, Jesus is. And Jesus is saying his secret of ministry and life which he was modeling to us, is that he's living his life in the Father, and the Father is living his life through the Son. Now, in verse 12, it says, I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, if anyone steadfastly believes in me, what is it that Jesus wants us to believe about him? He wants us to have a revelation that he is in the Father, and the Father is now dwelling in him and through him. He says, anyone who steadfastly believes in me, he himself will be able to do the things I do. And he will do even greater things than these because I go to the Father. So now he's uh, given us an example of how his relationship with God is, the Father, and now he's saying, you can do the things that I do. 
You can even do greater things that I have done. And that was something for us to push and something for us to understand that the same God the Father who worked in Jesus wants to work through us. And now Jesus says in verse 13, And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified and extolled through the Son. So the objective of Jesus performing the miracles is to bring honor and glory to, Jesus, glory to the Father. And he says, verse 14, Yes, I will grant whatever you ask in my name. Jesus now not only describes his relationship with the Father, he defines for us or he describes for us what should our relationship be with God. And in John 14, verse 15 says, If you really love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the Father and he will give you another comforter. Now, different names for the comforter of the Holy Spirit is counselor. This is his function. He's a counselor. He's a helper. He's an intercessor. He's an advocate. He's a strengthener and he's standby. Standby in the place of Jesus. All of this describes the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is saying, if you really love me, and keep my commandments, he will ask the Father and he will give us the comforter. Now, when we talk about another comforter, we're not talking about this is one iPad and that is another iPad. Jesus is saying, I'm going to the Father and I'm giving you another comforter that looks just like me. This is one iPad, you see another iPad, exactly the same size, the same model, the same color. Now, Jesus was saying that to his disciples, that when he goes away, the Holy Spirit is exactly like Jesus in spirit form. So many of us get confused about the Holy Spirit. How does the Holy Spirit look? He looks just like Jesus. Gee, the Holy Spirit is Jesus in spirit. And he says, I will give you that comforter. He will be your helper. He will be your intercessor. Verse 17, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. The world cannot welcome or receive this Christ or this Jesus or the Holy Spirit because it does not see him or know or recognize him. But you know and recognize him. Why? Because Jesus lives with you constantly and will be in you. So when it talks about Jesus, it's talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will be in you. He lives in you constantly and will be in you. You know, the apostles knew Jesus in the flesh. Paul knew Jesus in the spirit. Paul was not around when Jesus was on the earth. He was born after the time of Jesus' death and resurrection, but he wrote most of the New Testament because he had a revelation of Jesus, who he is in spirit. So what matters to us this morning is not whether we were there with the disciples when Jesus was on earth, it is the revelation we have about Jesus and we could know him as spirit. And that's what Jesus is telling his disciples. He goes on to say, verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. You will not be comfortless. You will not be desolate or bereaved or helpless. I will come back to you. How will he come back to you? By the Holy Spirit, just a little while now when the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me because I live, you will live also. How will we see him? Through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings revelation in our hearts. At that time, when that day comes of Jesus res resurrected, then you will know what, should, what will the Holy Spirit reveal to us. We will know that Jesus is in the Father now look at this. Not only we will know that Jesus is in the Father, but you and I and all of us are in Christ, and now Christ is in all of us. Somebody shout an amen. amen. So Jesus is describing for us what his relationship with the Father, now he's describing to us through the Holy Spirit what is our relationship with the Father. 
Now, Jesus is saying, He is in the Father, and now you and I are also in Christ, and Christ is in you. Can you see the significance of this teaching? You see, the apostles were so successful, the foundations of the early church was built on this revelation. That they lived, they moved, and they existed in the revelation and the understanding that they were living their life in Christ, and Christ was living out his life through them. That was the revelation of the New Testament. Now, what does it mean to live out our life in Christ? There are a lot of teachings that I did on it, but to simply sum it up is that our belief is in Christ, our thinking process is in Christ, our wisdom is in Christ. That's what it means to live in Christ. And then Christ lives in us. Verse 21, the person who has my commands and keeps them is the one who really loves me. And whoever really loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and will show or reveal or manifest myself to him I will let myself be clearly seen by him and make myself real to him or to us. Now, so Jesus is saying two things. If you really love me, you'll keep my commandments. We'll talk about that commandments later. Don't get confused about it. But Jesus is saying something much more important than the commandments. If you really love me, you will keep my commandments. What is the reward? God is saying... I will manifest, I will reveal myself, I will show you who I am. And that's the key for revelation. In verse 15 and also in verse 21, Jesus is highlighting one thing. He's looking for lovers. He's not looking for followers. He's not looking for believers. He's looking for, what is he looking for? Can you say that again? What is he looking for? He's looking for lovers. And that's why the Bible is saying, if you really love me, obedience is only an outworking of our love. Now, how many of you know, or have you experienced this, the teachers you dislike, you dislike their subjects. Put your hand up. I got a lot of company. If you love the teacher, you love the subject. Isn't that true? And if you want it a little more updated, Think about your partner, husband and wife. When you're angry, everything is no. Why? Because it's difficult to obey without love. Love is the motivating factor that, that, that provokes us to love. And Jesus is talking about love because he's looking for lovers. He's not looking for an army that will say, yes, sir, and no, sir. He's looking for intimate relationship. He's looking for people who will be motivated by love. So Judas is the one who asks the question. He says, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself or make yourself real to us and not to the world? Now look at the answer Jesus gives him. What does it say? If Je Jesus says, if a person... Yes. Say it again. If a person... Yes. What will he do? He will keep my word. And what will be the father's response? My father will love him. We will come. Who's the we? Not your country cousins. Who's the we will come? The father, the son, and the Holy Spirit will come to him who really loves and keeps the word. God the father, God the son, God the Holy Spirit will come to him. And what would he do? Make our home in capital letters. I didn't write it. That's what the Bible says. Our home. That means God will make our body, our dwelling place, his abode, a special dwelling place with him. How many of you like your homes to be like that? Here's the recipe for it. This is what defines our Christian life. How much of God we carry in us? How much of God people can see around us? Christ indwelling presence. You notice that 
in these few verses that we read, Jesus only reveals himself to lovers. Isn't that true? If you really love me, if you really love me, if you really love me, I will make my abode. Who do you stay with? Those you love? Why did you get married? I hope it's because you love the person. I just hope. Not because my parents said get married. You really want to live with the person you love. And God is saying, if you really love, uh, love me, I will move in with you. I will make your dwelling place my dwelling place. I will live my life with you. My presence will be with you. And that's what Jesus is doing. He reveals, he manifests himself to lovers. You know, for too long, the, churches, the church has focused on being believers rather than lovers. If there were more lovers in the church, Christianity would be a different uh, ball game altogether. Isn't that true? And we are struggling with religion while God is wanting to woo our hearts. Jesus' message to us is that when he dies, he will live again. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit will now make his dwelling with us and in us. That's why the greatest revelation in the New Testament where the angels announce Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. So the God we worship is not a God who is far off. He's a God who is nearby. He's a God that wants to move in with you. He's a God that wants to walk in you. He's a God who wants to express himself through you. We will look at that as we go on. Look at John 14, 24. Now this is the, on the negative side. Anyone who does not really love me, does not observe my commands or my teachings, and the teaching which you hear and heed is not mine, but comes from the Father who sent me. I have told you these things while I am still with you. But the Comforter, who is also a counselor, he's also your helper, he's also your intercessor, he's also your advocate, he's one who strengthens you, he's one who stands in the place of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in his name will represent me and act on my behalf. He will teach you all things and he will cause you to recall or remind you or bring to your remembrance everything I've told you. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Dwelling in us, revealing to us, reminding us. Now Jesus gives us simple instruction that's applicable for all believers. Simple instruction. Nothing complicated. People don't understand the Bible, not because it's difficult, it's because it's too simple. You heard what I said? We complicate the Bible rather than looking at the simplicity of the Bible. It says in John 15, here's the simple instruction. Dwell, how? In me. Dwell in Christ. Learn to live out your life in Christ. Learn to think the thoughts of Christ. Learn to believe the things that Christ has said in his word. You're living out, dwelling in Christ. What will happen? Christ will dwell in you. Now, dwell is, not, is different from visiting. He doesn't say when you, uh, dwell, uh, when you abide in me or dwell in me, I will visit you. He says, no, I will dwell with you. Something permanent, something of a resident. The translation says, live in me, and I will live my life in you. Just as no branch can bear fruit of itself without abiding in or being vitally united to the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. Now, if a girl got pregnant without marriage or without a relationship, everyone thinks, huh? there was only one Mother Mary. There cannot be two. So if a person wants to start a family, what they start with? Getting married. If you want to be fruitful in your Christian life, what do you start with? Getting married with Christ. Dwelling with Christ. It's your dwelling with Christ that makes you fruitful. 
Jesus gives us an example of wine and the branch only to help us understand how significant it is, it is for us to dwell in Christ. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit without being part of the vine, we cannot bear fruit without being abiding, dwelling, or living our life out in Christ, and Christ living out his life in us. So Jesus says in verse 5, I am the vine. You are the branches. All of us are the branches. Whoever lives in Christ, in me, whoever is living out their life in Christ, and Christ is in him, bears much fruit. We all want to be fruitful. No one likes to live their life unproductive. Neither does the Father choose you to be unproductive. He's called you by name. He's chosen you so that we all can be productive. He has united us with Christ so that fruitfulness will flow out of us. And so Jesus says, however, apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, when Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing, he says, you cannot do anything in terms of significance of fruitfulness apart from me. Life comes from him. Now, there are a lot of things you can do apart from Christ, but the very things that he's calling us to do, you cannot do without him. In verse 7, he continues to emphasize if you live in Christ, if you live in me, abide vitally united to me, and my words remain in you. You see how Jesus is giving us a simple instruction. He's giving us examples. He's, he's nailing it. He wants us to understand. He's modeled his relationship with the Father, and now saying, look, I want your relationship with me to be the same. He says, abide in me, unite with me, be united with me. Let my words remain in you and continue to live in your hearts. Ask whatever you will and it will be done for you. Now we know the second part of the verse very well. The Bible says, ask and he will do. He didn't do this, he didn't do this, he didn't do this. Look, your asking must come from a place of abiding. It's when you abide in him that you know what to ask for. It's when you abide in him you have a right perspective of what God wants to do in you and through you. So he says, ask and it will be done for you. Verse 8, when you bear much fruit, my father is honored and glorified. And you show and prove yourself to be true followers of me. Fruitfulness. Seeing people's lives starts, seeing people's lives transformed, people being delivered, people being uh, blessed is fruitfulness that comes out of abiding with Christ. I didn't say this in the first service, but maybe somebody here needs to hear this. I learned something in the Bible school. You learned something, yeah. And this is one statement that one of the lecturers said. He says, all ministry flows out of our relationship with God. Every ministry is an overflow of our relationship with God. And so if you want to be effective in ministry, ministry is an overflow of your abiding and dwelling with God. So our Christian life is not defined by what we do for Christ, but our Christian life is defined by what Christ does through us. So I'm going to simplify it for you. Our Christian life is not about us living for Christ. It's, for, it's about Christ living his life through us. You'd like to say that after me? My Christian life, my Christian life. is not about no. me living my life for Christ, <laughs> but it is Christ living Christ. His, life his life through me. You believe that? Yes. That's what you Christian like. Many people are trying to be loving. The love is on the inside of you. For many of us, Christ is suffocated on the inside. We need to allow the Holy Spirit, we need to allow Christ to express himself through us. And every time you're praying for someone, every time you're talking to someone, you are aware that Jesus on the inside wants to manifest himself for the Father's glory. You live out life like that. This is what Jesus is saying. 
I have loved you just as the Father has loved you. Abide in my love. Christianity is not about what you do. It's about how you abide. Abide in love. If you keep my commandments, if you continue to obey my instructions, you will abide in my love and live on in it just as I have obeyed my Father's commandments and live on in His love. Look at the parallel. His relationship with the Father, He says, I modeled it. This is how you do it. Just as I, as I have obeyed His commandments, living out in the Father's love, being called the beloved Son of God, Jesus says, no, that love is offered to you. In John chapter 4, verse 15, and verses 15 to 9, and some of the verses that we've been reading, now Jesus tells us how to be lovers. How do we become a lover of God? Here is what the Bible says. If you really love me, you will keep my commandments, the evidence of God, our love for him. Verse 15, chapter 15, verse 9, if you keep my commandments, we abide in his love. How do we remain in his love? By abiding. How do we become lovers of God? We become lovers of God when we recognize that God's love for us is unconditional. God has done us no wrong. God has emptied himself so that we can be filled. We look at the love that God demonstrated while we did not deserve it. When we understand his love, we become lovers of God and we, we, we will be willing to obey his commandments. Now Jesus says in verse 11, I have told you these things, that my joy, look at the words joy, and delight may be in you, and that your joy and gladness may be a full measure and complete and overflowing. Now, you can make it when a young person falls in love. True? There's something different about their life. They're smiling for nothing. <laughs> and you look at them, they seem to be happy for nothing. And you can almost guess, hey, is there a girl in your life or there's a boy in your life? Why? Because love makes you happy. Isn't that true? Have you seen an angry person happy? He has no clue what it means to be happy or be joyous. But lovers will have carry a spirit of joy. And what is Jesus saying? When you really love me and you keep my commandments, as a lover, you will carry a spark. There will be a joy that comes out of your life. Why? Because you're in a love relationship. The happiest people on earth are the people who know that they are loved. The saddest people on earth and the depressive people on earth are the people who know they're not loved. A happy person is a loving person. Or a person in love is a person who is happy. And Jesus is worthy of our love. Now, what is this one thing that Jesus kept saying? Keep my commandments. If you really love me, keep my commandments. If you really love me, you will follow my instructions. What is this instruction? Now, it's not complicated. Don't look at all the memory verses that you learn. Do this, do this, do this. One line, simple. One instruction, only one commandment. Tell someone next to you, don't be discouraged. Only one instruction that you have to obey. Tell someone next to you, only one. And Jesus builds the psalm till verse 12. He first defines what his relationship with the Father is. He tells us how significant our relationship with the Father is by abiding in Christ and Christ living. He explains it all and he keeps saying, if you really love me, you'll keep my instructions. If you really love me, you will obey me. And those who obey me really loves me. And what is it that you want us to do? Look at verse 12. This is my commandment. That you love one another. You might as well say, Lord, take me home right now. <laughs> you know, somehow even stopping your addictions doesn't seem much of a challenge. Loving one another seems to be a challenge. And it says, look, it didn't say love one another full stop. I wish he put a full stop there. He says, love one another. How? Just as 
He loved who? You. Same measure. He's given you the same platform that he had. He's given you the same love that he received, Jesus received. And so he gives us the same commandment that he received. Love one another. Just as the Father or as he has loved you. To love one another the way Jesus loved us is not rocket science. It's not about doing. Now when we talk about love, love one another, we all have a yardstick. He never loved me. He never loved me. What he's talking about love? He never loved me. Hey, this yardstick is not for someone else. It's for you. For who? Me. So it says love one another the way, the, the way I loved you. How did Jesus love us? Simple. He loved you when you were unloving. Yes or no? Anyone thought you were lovable, such a lovable person that Jesus couldn't stop loving you? Anyone here? You're sitting in the wrong place. You see, Jesus loved you when we were unlovable. Jesus accepted us when we were unacceptable. Jesus forgave us even when we didn't deserve forgiveness. Jesus reached out to us even when we didn't reach out to him. Now Jesus is saying, this is my commandment, that you love one another who are unloving. You can say, ouch, no problem. You love one another the way Christ loved you. You forgive one another, which is unconditional. He will never come and say sorry. She will never put on a sorry face also. But you, what? Why do you forgive? Because Christ loved you by forgiving you. It's a dem forgiveness is a demonstration of love. Accepting one another wholeheartedly is a demonstration of love. Love is an attitude. Love is a motivating factor that causes us to do something. And it says, I want you to be motivated with that love to love one another the way I have loved you. So if you don't understand how God loved you, you will never be able to pass on that love to another person. Who are the ones who are unforgiving? The ones who are unforgiving are the ones who have not really understood Father's love towards you. Who are the ones who are unaccepting are the ones who have not experienced God's wholehearted acceptance. Are you getting this this morning? Yeah. yeah. So something drastically is wrong with our understanding about God. Because when you soak yourself in what God is to you, it's an overflow to what God is to others. You begin to reach out. You begin to forgive. It comes naturally. You begin to, your kindness that's the command that Jesus gave, gave us. And it goes on to say, when we abide in this command, we dwell in his love, and then whatever we ask, it will be done by him. Jesus will do it. When we have this abiding relationship, how do we abide in this love? Let's look at Luke chapter 6, 37. Judge not. Can you complete it after me? Condemn not. You like that? You know, this finger comes up very fast, this one. We quickly judge people. We quickly write people off. Every time you criticize someone, every time you condemn someone, every time you judge someone, you're putting yourself outside of God's love outside an abiding relationship with Christ. And God doesn't want that to, uh, to happen. He says, you learn to abide in my love by learning to extend that to other people around you. So if you're married, husbands, you can quietly hold your wife's hand just to communicate something. And wife, respond. Afternoon talk. You can talk how many hours you want to. Okay. My job is just to initiate. But you know what? Seven days in a week, we have six days to practice. One, two hours in the morning here to demonstrate what we practiced at home. Hello? 
we always faced with a challenge to love unconditionally, to love your spouse unconditionally, to love the people around you unconditionally, to be accepting towards them irrespective of who they are, what they say. That's your challenge as a Christian. That's what causes you to be abiding in the wine. And then it goes on in verse 38. It says, forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and what will happen to you? It will be given to you. Not maybe, it will be given. What are you giving away? What are you giving away this morning? I'm glad you said love and not money. Nowhere in the scripture talks about money. I know TV evangelists have stretched it. Every time they talk about money, they bring this verse. Yet Jesus not even mentioned the word money in this, in this passage. It says, when you don't judge, others will not judge you. When you don't condemn others, others will not condemn you. When you forgive others, others will begin to be forgiving to you. All of this is an outworking of love. And this is when you love, God says, oh, look at me. I'm not saying it. God says he will cause people to love you in return. How? Pressed down, shaken together, and running over with love. Can somebody shout an amen at this time? Now look at what it says here. He will give back to you good measure, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, put into your bosom. For with the same measure you use, same measure, you give you a little bit love, that much only will come back. So if you don't have friends, you need to start being a friend. Hello? If you don't experience the love of others, maybe it's an it's a, it's a indicator that you need to start sowing love into other people. Now here's the trick. Here's the subtleness of the enemy. When you love and say, oh, he never returned back. The Bible didn't say he will return. It says God will make sure God love comes back to you. Don't know who, don't know when, don't know how, but love will come back to you. When you begin to sow seeds of love, seeds of love will produce a harvest of love. Seeds of forgiveness will produce a harvest of forgiveness. Seeds of acceptance will produce a harvest of acceptance. Is this complicated? So Jesus is saying, the way you will dwell in me and I will dwell in you, the reason you would know that you really love me is by obeying my commandment. What's the commandment? Love one another the way I've loved you. That's the one commandment. You live in the abiding. You see, the more you give away, the more you know, understand how much more God loves you. You know, it becomes easy to pray for people when you know that God loves them. It becomes very difficult to pray for people when you don't know God loves them. Look at the prayer that Jesus made. Now, this is actually the prayer of Jesus for all of us before he ascended into heaven. John 17, 20, neither of these alone do I pray for, not only the disciples. It is not, only, it is not for their sake only that I make this request. Jesus is praying to the Father. But also for all those who will ever come to believe or trust or rely on me through their word and teaching. What is Jesus asking the Father? That they all may be one. Just as you, Father, are in me. Look at the prayer of Jesus. Look at Jesus' vision for your life. He's praying to the Father saying, just the way you, we are one, you are in me, and I am in you, that they also may be one in us. We become part of the Trinity. We become part of the, the family of God in heaven. We share the same relationship that Jesus had with the Father. Why? Because now we are in Christ, and now Christ is in the Father, and the Father is in Christ. We begin to live out our relationship from this revelation. Look, if you don't understand it this morning, ah, don't, don't be upset with yourself. The, the disciples never understood it immediately. But all I'm saying is make an effort and seek God to understand it. Because this is the heart of our Christian life. 
This is how our Christian life is lived out in this unique relationship of what it is to be in Christ and Christ is to be in you. It's, it's, the, it's the unity that Jesus is praying for that we will be one of him. You know, the purpose of Jesus dying on the cross or the purpose of him coming and dying on the cross is only for this, that we will be one with him. One with him. That's when the word us is there, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We will be one among them. You see, Jesus, the Son of God, chose to become the Son of Man so that you and I will be sons of God. Caught that? I'll say it again. Jesus, the Son of God, chose to become the Son of Man to make you and I the sons of God. As a unique relationship of oneness with God. It goes on to say in verse 22, look, I've given them the, the, the glory, the nature, the character. I've given them the glory and the honor which you gave me. Look at Jesus, what he's saying. He's talking to us. He's praying to the Father. I've given them that glory. I've given them the same honor you've given me. And we can call ourselves the sons of God. That they may be one, even as we, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, are one. In I in them and you in me, in order that they may become one and perfectly united, that the world will know and definitely recognize that you sent me and that you have loved them even as you have loved me. So Jesus modeled his relationship with the Father, described for us how our relationship with him must be, and then he says, look, the same way the Father loved me, I love you. The same way the Father called me sons, I call you sons. The same way the Father favor on my life is the same way he poured out his favor upon our life. You know, what a, what a truth. What, what an amazing demonstration of love that Jesus wanted us to be reunited back with the Father like as if nothing happened in the Garden of Eden. The, the mystery of the New Testament is wrapped up in the revelation of what I've just preached this morning. And this is what Colossians 1.26 says. The mystery for which was hidden for ages and generations. All the Old Testament people never had this revelation. They never had the privilege of what it is to know God in such an intimate way. It was hid from angels and men, but is now revealed to his holy people, that you and me, to whom God was pleased to make known how great for the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. What is that mystery? The mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the mystery of the New Testament church. That's the foundation for the New Testament church, that Christ wants to live out his life through us. Christ is the one that's motivating us and healing us and restoring us. It's the indwelling presence of Christ that we carry wherever we go. And if we can only be conscious of that presence and that Christ, His Spirit, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit abiding with us and in us, it will alter the way we live. It will alter the way we speak. We will become lovers of God. And that's why the Apostle Paul said this. I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives within me. He understood what the New Testament standard was. And he says it's Christ. The life I now live, I no longer live what, out of the, his self, but to, about, about Christ who dwells in him and who loved him. You know, this week, I only dwelt on these four chapters. I kept reading it over and over and over again. It brought such richness. And finally, after reading it at one time, you notice one thing about the Bible. The more you read it, the better it becomes. You read one chapter about four or five times and see, each time you read it, it gets deeper. Because Jesus is looking for seekers. And I shared that last, last Sunday. The jewels, the pearls are below the earth and the sea. It takes a seeker to deep, dive deep and to get the pearl. And God wants us as lovers to hound him for revelation. You know, lovers, they are so persistent. 
you don't know what it is look at the hindi movie that's all that's only for drama you go running 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 she be showing her face this side that side and a magical moment sometimes happen otherwise we wouldn't see the movie you know what that's what lovers do lovers seek and god wants us to read and read draw from it if this is the the crux of the new testament let's be lovers of god lovers of his word lovers of righteousness abiding in his word and as a result god will make us fruitful